Hi, I'm Tatiana, and I'm going to talk today about MLIR. Before we talk about MLIR, let's start from the basics. We are here because artificial intelligence is experiencing a tremendous growth. All the three components, algorithms, data, compute, have come together to change the world. Compute is really, really important because that's what enables machine learning researchers to build better algorithms, to build new models. And as you can see, the models are becoming much, much more complex. To train a model today, we need several orders of magnitude compute capabilities than we needed several years ago. And how do we build hardware which makes that possible? For those of you who are versed in hardware details, more lore is ending. This is also the end of the NART scaling. We cannot any more simply to say the next CPU is going to run at higher frequency, and because of that, that will power machine learning. What is happening in the industry is the explosion of custom hardware, and there is a lot of innovation which is driving this compute which makes artificial intelligence possible. So if we look at what is happening, you look in your pocket, you probably have cell phone. Inside that cell phone, most likely there is a little chip which makes artificial intelligence possible. And it's not just one chip, right? There is CPU, there is GPU, there is DSP, there is neural processing unit. All of that is sitting inside a little phone and seamlessly working together to make great user experience possible. In the data center, we see the explosion of specialized hardware also. Uh, Habana, specialized accelerations in CPUs, in GPUs, many different chips. We have TPUs. All of this is powering the tremendous growth of specialized compute in data centers. And once you have more specialized accelerators, that brings more complexity. And as we all know, hardware doesn't work by itself. It is powered by software. And so there is also a tremendous growth in software ecosystems for machine learning. Uh, in addition to TensorFlow, there are many other different frameworks which are trying to solve this problem. And actually, we got a problem with the explosive growth of hardware and software. Yeah. So the big problem here is that none of this scales. Too much hardware, too much complexity, too much software, too many different systems that are not working together. And what's the fundamental problem? The fundamental problem is that we as a technology industry across the board are reinventing the same kinds of tools, the same kinds of technologies, and we're not working together. And this is why you see the consequences of this. You see systems that don't interoperate because they're built by different people and different teams that solve different problems. You know, Vendor X is working on their chip, which makes perfect sense. It doesn't really integrate with all the different software. And likewise, for the software people that can't know or work with all the hardware people. Um, this is why you see things like you bring up your model, you try to get to work on a new piece of hardware, and it doesn't work right the first time. You see this in the cracks that form between these systems and that manifest as usability problems or performance problems or debuggability problems. And as a user, this is not something that you should have to deal with. So what do we want? Right? What we'd really love to do is take this big problem, which has many different pieces, and make it simpler by getting people to work together. And so we've thought a lot about this, and the way we, th we think that we can move the world forward is not by saying that there is one right way to do things. I don't think that works in a field that's as growing as explosively as machine learning. Instead, what we think the right way to, get to do this is, is to introduce building blocks. And instead of standardizing the user experience or standardizing the one right way to do machine learning, we think that we as a technology industry can standardize some of the underlying building blocks that go into these tools, that can go into the compiler for a specific chip, that can go into a translator that, that works between one system or the other. And if we build building blocks, we know and we can think about what we want from them. We want, of course, the best-in-class graph technology. Right? That, that's, that's a given. We want the best compiler technology. Compilers are really important. We want to solve not just training, but also inference, mobile, and servers. 
and including all permutations, so training on the edge, super important, growing, growing, growing in uh, popularity. We don't want this to be a new kind of technology island uh, solution. We want this to be part of a continuous ecosystem that spans the whole problem. And so this is what MLIR is all about. MLIR is a new system that we, we at Google have been building, but we are bringing to the industry to help solve some of these common problems that, that manifest in different ways. And so one of the things that we're really excited about is that MLIR is not just a Google technology. We are collaborating extensively with hardware makers across the industry, and we're seeing a lot of excitement and a lot of adoption by people that are building the world's uh, biggest and most popular hardware across, across the world. But what is MLIR? Well, so MLIR is a compiler infrastructure. Um, and if you're not familiar with compilers, what it's really saying is it's saying that it is providing that bottom level technology, low level technology, that underpins building individual tools and individual systems that then get used to help with graphs and help with chips and things like that. And so how does this work? Well, what MLI provides, if you look at it in contrast to other systems, is that it is not, again, a one size fits none kind of a solution. It's trying to be technology, technology that powers these systems. And so, like we said before, it of course contains the state of the art compiler technology. And we have, uh, both within Google, we have dozens of years of compiler experience within the team, but we probably have hundreds of years of compiler experience across the industry all collaborating together on this common platform. Uh, it is designed to be modular and extensible because requirements continue to change in our field. It's not designed to tell you the right way to do things. As a system integrator, it's designed to provide tools so that you can solve your problems. Now, if you dive into the compiler, there's a whole bunch of different pieces, and so there are things like uh, you know, low-level graph transformation systems. There are things for code generation, so that if you're building a chip, you can handle like picking the right kernel. But the point of this is that MLIR does not force you to use one common pipeline. It turns out that while compilers for code generation are really great, so are handwritten kernels. And if you have handwritten kernels that are tuned and optimized for your application, of course they should slot into the same framework, should work with existing runtimes, and we really see MLIR as providing useful value that then can be used to solve problems. It is not trying to force everything into one box. So you may be wondering, though, for you, if you're not a compiler person or a system integrator or a chip person, what does this mean to you? And so let's talk about what it means for TensorFlow. So what it means for TensorFlow is it allows us to build a better system because integrating TensorFlow with the myriad of specialized hardware is really a hard problem. And with MLIR, we can build a unified infrastructure layer, which will make it much simpler for TensorFlow to seamlessly work with any hardware chip which comes out. For you as a Python developer, it simply means better developer experiences. A lot of things that today might be not working as smoothly as we would like them to can be res resolved by MLIR. And so this is just one example. You write a model, you try to run it through the TensorFlow, TensorFlow light converter, you get an error, you have no clue what it is, and now we see issues on GitHub and try to help you. With MLIR, you will get an error message that says, this is the line of Python code which caused the problem. You can look at it and fix the problem yourself. And just to summarize, the reason we are building MLIR is because we want to move faster, and we want the industry to move faster with us. And one of the keys to make industry work well together is neutral governance. And that's why we submitted MLIR as a project to LLVM, and now it is part of LLVM ecosystem. Uh, the code is moving soon. And this is very important because LLVM has a 20-year history of neutral governance and building the infrastructure which is used by everybody in the world. And this is just the beginning. Uh, please stay tuned. We are building a global community around MLIR. And once we are done, ML will be better for everybody, and we will see much faster advance of artificial intelligence in the world. One more quick. Oh, thank you. Thank you.